the Pony Express, active for just 18 months, remains etched in historical memory. But how does this legendary lore align with reality? Join us for this episode of Riding the West, the video cast of the Overland Journal, as we delve into the truth behind the fabled lore. Hi, I'm Bob Clark. I'm the editor of Overland Journal for the Oregon California Trails Association. And uh, we have a series of videos we're producing now called Riding the West. And I'm privileged to be here with Scott Allenbaugh, who is the author of a recent two-part article entitled The Pony Express, Nuggets of Truth. And we published that in the summer and fall issues of Overland Journal. They're available now. Uh, Scott, welcome. Glad to have you here. Thanks, Bob. Great to be here. Hey, I, I've got initially a question that has puzzled me because I have pretensions of trying to do things I shouldn't do. What <laughs> would cause a man of a certain age to undertake a what I think was a 1,400-mile trip across the country from St. Joe to Sacramento on a bike? <clears throat> Good question. Um, actually, 1,400 miles is what I rode, but that was only to Salt Lake City. So that's oh. two-thirds of the Pony Express route. I didn't ride the final third, um, which we can talk about or not, but 1,400 miles was plenty, I got to tell you. When I first read that someone had created a bikepacking route that followed the Pony Express on dirt trails, I really just felt like I had to do it. I, I've been a cyclist for years, long distance cyclist, a lot of road riding some mountain biking, but it just sounded too good to pass up. And then what made me start to take it on now at this age, well, first I heard about it, but my, my biggest, bigger concern was that in a few years, it probably wouldn't be safe to do a trip like that as a solo trip. Again, as you said, you know, being of a certain age, it just might not be prudent. So that kind of gave me the impetus I need to get over all my hesitations about logistics and, you know, concerns. Sure. That's sure. now or never kind of a thing. Oh, I get it. Why did you stop in Salt Lake City? For one thing, the uh, uh, pioneers, of course, you know, the immigrants um, had to go through the desert in the summer because they had to beat the Sierra snows. Point Express riders had to go through the desert in the summer because that was their job. I didn't have that pressure. So I didn't see a smart reason to ride through the Great Basin in July in the heat of the in the heat of the summer. So the route itself went followed the the Oregon California Trail to Salt Lake City and then across Nevada. Right. And over the Sierra and into Sacramento. Correct. When you finished your trip, you wrote a book which is now available called On the Pony Express Trail, One Man's Bikepacking Journey to Discover History from a Different Kind of Saddle. Would you have written that book uh, anyway? I, did you plan that all along? I Actually, I didn't. Um, um, I decided to blog my progress across. Um, so every day when I had a signal, um, I would update of a daily progress of my ride along with pictures. And as a result, well, one thing that happened was that I noticed more and more people were, were following my blog. So I had to start writing longer and longer entries and make them better. So at the end of the trip, I not only had um, a good account, I had a first impression account of what I was going through. So that made writing the book that coupled with all the research I had done a pretty straightforward process. So um, it made a lot of sense at that point. Hmm. Um, just by the by, we'll be reviewing that book in our next issue of Overland Journal. So you can watch it come up. It's very kind to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> a trip of this magnitude, of this scope, takes a lot of preparation. So I'm wondering how you prepared both physically and from a historical perspective. Right. Well, as I explained, I spent, well... I spent a year, probably 15, 17 months just reading, um, just to get background on everything. During that time, I also took the, the rough um, map of the route that, that Jan Bennett, a cyclist, had drawn of a Pony Express route. And I, mm -hmm. I went over it in 
just very detailed fashion so that I knew exactly where I was going to be staying every night if I could make the distance and such. So I was very conscious of that. Um, the other thing is I needed to train physically. Um, I had a mountain bike, which I was going to ride and I'm going to be towing my gear in a trailer, which came to about 35 pounds of, of gear that I was hauling. Um, so to replicate that, I hooked the trailer up to my mountain bike and threw a 40 pound sandbag in back and just started riding around Davis and, you know, nearby areas up in the hills. I also pre-rode parts of the route um, in California and Nevada to get an idea what it would be like. Did you tackle many big hills going, for instance, going up the foothills of the Sierra? Yes. Yeah. Um, by far the worst hills were in the Sierras, especially as you got close to uh, Immigrant Gap or Immigrant Summit here. Yes. Uh, 50. Um, those were those were by far the, the most mountain bike like single track trails, the most technical riding um, and some of the worst trails, actually, in terms of I, I don't know how I would have negotiated it with the trailer, to be honest. I was doing it as scouting rides, as day rides. So I just had the bike um, and I walked up a number of hills during that. I, I think the immigrants of the 19th century probably would agree with you. <laughs> that hitting the Sierra Nevada was the biggest challenge they faced. Yeah. Well, and they were wiped out by that point. I mean, I can't even imagine taking months to cross and then having to face the Sierras. Can't even imagine. Your articles that we published focus not so much on your journey and the challenges you found there, but rather on the fictions and the mythology surrounding the Pony Express. Right. Um, how much of that were you aware of before you started? Well, I wasn't aware of any of it when I started my research. Really? I mean, yeah, not at all. I mean, I, I, I saw the ride. I wanted to do the ride. Um, and Jan had put little snippets by each one of the, of the um, stations, uh -huh. which she had taken from um, Arthur Godfrey's study of the trail, you know, the preparation for the, you know, it was the Pony Express historical resource paper so okay. she put little blurbs about them so I thought okay great so I started to read but then the more I read the more I found chinks in the armor so to speak um, places where the mythology said one thing but if you dug a little deeper you found out that that wasn't exactly true so I started to follow those more again because I had so much time I could yeah. go down those rabbit holes you know and, and find those uh, kind of arcane facts and well, as you know, um, and many people may or may not know, um, there is very little primary documentation about the Pony Express. So most of what we have are, there are some recollections, of course, um, which were usually made 50 years after the fact. But, um, you know, we kind of have wishful thinking about the Pony Express. So, so when you find the few pieces of information that actually exist from that time, you find a very different picture from what we're presented with today. I had no idea when I first started my research. Interesting. You know, Pony Express is, is an icon of the Western experience. Uh, we've lifted it up. Does it deserve to be an icon like that, or should it be taken off its pedestal? I think it should be taken off its pedestal. But I think it's also a moot point because I don't think there's any way that's going to happen. It's too embedded in our Western psyche to, yeah. you know, to really say, hey, let's take another look at this. Um, and really, my goal in, in writing those articles um, wasn't to say, let's ditch the Pony Express as an icon, but to say, you know, if you're going to say, you know, you're interested in the Pony Express, you really want to know about it. Well, here are the real facts. You can still like it, despite, you know, the fact that the, the truth isn't what you think you know. But, you know, there are other services, there are other things that could be, I guess I would say could equally have, have been those icons of the West. But this is the one that got picked up, primarily because of Buffalo Bill. And that's interesting because, uh, what, 1860, um, the story's almost over, and people must not have had a whole lot of awareness of the Pony Express then until 
Buffalo Bill steps in and starts romanticizing the experience at his Wild West show. Right. Right. I, you know, some writers have made excuses for that. They said, oh, well, the Civil War came along, so no one had time to think about it. You sure. Know, after the Civil War, you know, then, you know, they remembered. Um, in my mind, while I was writing this, I was kind of thinking that in a sense, the Pony Express was sort of like what fax machines were to us. You know, I mean, they were great when they came out, but as soon as email came along, you know, kick it out the window. Well, yes. same thing with the Pony Express. I mean, it was great, but as soon as the telegraph was finished, it's like, get rid of it. And no one's really going to look back and say, gosh, I wish we were riding our horses through the Wyoming winter to deliver mail. You know what I mean? It, it's it's really easy to be romantic when you're not the person, you know, on the horse in the middle of winter trying to get the mail through. So, so the promise of the Express was, we'll get your letter across the country in 10 days, right? right? That was a promise. Um, a couple of things though. First of all, that they were delivering very many letters because it was too expensive. Ah. Really what they were delivering was uh, newspaper clippings from newspaper, latest news from the East to the West. And that's why when you read newspapers in California, they think the Pony Express is the greatest thing in the world because they're the ones who are benefiting. Yeah, um, they're scooping it, yeah. Exactly, and also, you know, like so much of the Pony Express, the, the whole 10 day delivery thing is not exactly true because during the winter of, of 1860, 1861, the Pony Express moved the delivery time back from 10 days to 15 days. And if you, if you follow the actual schedule, um, it was often closer to 20 days or more. And that was the same amount of time it was taking the Butterfield Overland Mail to deliver via the much longer Southern route because they didn't have the snow to worry about. But that uh, Rocky Mountain winter, the Pony Express couldn't beat that. It couldn't meet the 10 days. Um, yeah. You don't read about that much, but you know, every time, every time I read, oh, the Pony Express got the mail through in 10 days, then well, no, they said they would, but they didn't. So the Butterfield delivered in 20 some days, right? 25, well, 21. 26. They were 21. Well, after the first couple of months, they were down to 21. They they were either on schedule or ahead of it. And it was and usually the, 21 days. And the Butterfield is taking a southern route. They're going down through Texas and uh, New Mexico and Arizona and then coming up into California and then uh, on up right. to what? San Francisco, I presume. Correct. Okay. Oh. So when are you, you going to take your bike and ride <laughs> Missouri? <laughs> over the butterfield <laughs> as soon as someone lays out a bike packing yeah because i i can't even, that's that's 2800 miles wow there was 20 as a, you know the pony express was 1900 right mm -hmm. the pony express bike packing route is 2100 because of private property issues how long would the butterfield be today for the same issues you know the same private property issues Yes, I, I wouldn't mind following it in California. I think it'd be interesting to take it from San Francisco to, to Yuma, um, especially because I, I'd be interested to see how much of the desert portion you could actually ride. Uh, and how much of that's on private property? I have, I have no idea. Well, I'll tell you, we look forward to that article. <laughs> After you completed that, really, it would be fascinating. There's so much work to do on, on the Butterfield, especially in California. Right. We really appreciate you, Scott, doing this interview with us. Um, for those of you watching, you'll find lots of fascinating articles in Overland Journal, and we invite you to, to subscribe by becoming a member of Oregon California Trails Association. Just visit our website, and, and you'll be there. Um, and in the meantime, thank you, Scott. Happy travels. Thanks a lot, Bob. This is great. Thank you. Take care.